we good to go, Lee? Yeah. Okay. Welcome to the March live edition of the Industry Angel. <laughs> so today we have the MD of iEvo, who are a manufacturer of biometric security systems. Now, our guest today has had tonsillitis. Okay. So we'll have to, oh, so we'll have to cut him a bit slack. So welcome to the show, Sean Oaks. You notice Sean didn't say hi there. I thank you very much. He's keeping everything on a minimal. So that this might be like drawn teeth, might it? So thank you. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us, Sean. And, and well done. I know you've been struggling this week. Um, so biometric security systems. We know all about that stuff here. Um, where did it start? How did this all come about? Because it's not something you just randomly think about. Did, were you in that industry beforehand? Or? No, absolutely not. I was in uh, food retail, actually, okay. management in food retail um, for pretty much most of my career since I left uh, college, where I did do, uh, at the time, a diploma in electronics and digital electronics, um, which was in the southwest. Um, however, unfortunately, at that time, two of the biggest um, employers within that region had actually laid off about 2,000 people. So it became apparent very quickly that the industry that I was looking to go into, um, there weren't really many job prospects at that time. But I've been working since the age of, well, my mum would say different, probably about the age of 13 when I, when I stole my dad's lawnmower and <laughs> set off one morning to try and earn some money mowing lawns locally. But um, yeah, I got a a job as a Saturday student in um, a small ironmongery place in in the main city near where we live and then I uh, put my CV in which was extremely limited at that time but put my CV into uh, Sainsbury's and um, yeah eventually got offered a, a job there and um, that was the start of that career I guess and worked my way up from Saturday student all the way up to uh, higher management. Within Sainsbury, so when you mentioned food retail, that, w that was where you were at? Yeah, I mean, I got I was very fortunate at the time. They were looking uh, predominantly, um, Sainsbury's one of the biggest employers, most renowned um, food supermarkets, along with m and I mean, if you got a management position in one of those retail companies at the time, you were, well, what used to be back in the day, set for life, as, as they used to say. Um, so <clears throat> they were predominantly looking for postgraduates. And then I think they realised that they were missing out on some opportunities of, um, you know, different views and thoughts, if you like, within their management structure and how they wanted to take the business forward. So I was nominated at store level to go on to a management training programme, which was really quite intense over um, two to three years. But looking back now, it was, com you know, absolutely amazing. Um, the the amount of stuff that you had to learn, you had to, uh, you had to learn everything that a store manager would know, mm -hmm. even though you were starting at the lower end of the management chain, if you like. Um, so, yeah, I still recommend retail management today to anybody or anybody at a younger age to go out and get a Saturday job. Was, it, was this in your 20s when you were doing this management? Or? No, no, it was straight at 18. Was it really? Yeah. So, straight yeah, I, was, I literally wow. um, went in as a, I was working on the meat department, I think, um, and I'm on the checkouts, so mm -hmm. uh, with all my friends <laughs> uh, and peers, and then the next day I turned up in in a disgusting brown suit, but it was a suit. Um, yeah, so that that raised quite a few eyebrows, and then you know, chucked in at the deep end, you had to literally go up to people who were your, who were your peers mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in the position you were current you know, formally in, and then have to go up and you know start to manage um, these people and and send requests out on what you wanted them to do so yeah yeah it's uh it, it was tough so did tough. you ultimately end up in managing the store yeah i moved um from sainsbury's to then i went to cws which was quite a big progression in in the career path that i was in um and i ended up doing area management and i was put on them um, managing a number of stores as well which were under underperforming and turned those stores around um, and then I ended up working for Safeway before it became Morrison's, as yeah. was. But there were you know, certain reasons I ended up in that move that weren't necessarily a career progression, just a 
bit of a life change and um as great as food retail is it's um you know you can get burnt out yeah. pretty quickly it's um I was going to ask you, is in the northeast because I'm detecting a non-northeast accent there. Why, I man, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> uh, you don't know. Uh, um, no, so I was born in Plymouth, um, lived in Cornwall, lived in Swindon for some of my childhood. So it really depends how many beers I've had to okay. what what twang of accent you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna receive. Yeah, and this is water on the table. By the way. <laughs> so. Obviously, you studied like electrical engineering, was it? Did you? Did you? Say? Well, I mean, it was electronics and digital right, okay. electronics. Okay. But bearing in mind that was oof, at least ten years ago when I was eighteen. Who's laughed? Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, uh, you know, compared to now, oof, not, yeah, yeah, not yeah. even worth what it was written on a postage stamp, really. But so because you studied that in the retail, were you the go-to guy for systems? No, 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 no not really. I no. think um, just there. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, really. I think it was, um, you know, at, at that age, you, you're young, you're immature. Um, I look back now over um, some of the decisions I made and some of the actions I did within that um, within that opportunity that I had in life, and I've, I've certainly learned from them. Um, I don't have regrets as such, but I think as you, as you get older um, and more mature, I'd like to think anyway, um, you know, it gives you time to look back and reflect because you, you can use those those lessons that you've learned mm -hmm. earlier on in life to ensure that you don't make the same mistakes later on in life. And um, you know, I have no regrets with food retail, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely none at all. It it's helped me and my own business tremendously over the years. Um, but yeah, it you know, it added good good points and bad points. It's interesting, you, you kind of reminded me about my youth as well. So I, I kind of did an apprenticeship in a large blue chip company and I hated every minute of it, mm. especially through my 20s. I did, it was lots of process, um, lots of management pushing you to do different things that you didn't want to do and non-agile like we are now in SME. But looking back, I wouldn't have changed it because it's taught me so much. So when you do get into that SME space, you think, wow, I actually know so much. Yeah. Did, did, so you feel yeah, that's well, invaluable? The, one of the things that I did learn uh, in food retail is being um, a, a younger manager, you were seen as the f the future of the business. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, as I said, Sainsbury's was, was number one and they lost out um, pretty rapidly to Tesco's. Um, this is in the, the war, if you like, of the, the industry. And um, one of the most frustrating parts within um, that particular company was as younger managers you were taken away for periods of time or training courses and they they or head office understood you as the future of you know the business you mm -hmm. were the people who were going to you know move the business forward no pressure well no no it, <laughs> the, the only pressure came is when you went back to store um because the the store management at that time which is what i believe to be a lot of the problem was very old school Mm -hmm. It was very, uh, you know, it was more like a dictatorship working in, in there and um, unrealistic targets were set and, uh, you know, this is how they were brought up to manage anyway. And one of the biggest battles you would face is you would be leaving one of these courses, you know, infused and refreshed and you'd want to go back in and implement what you've learned into the store. And then within a matter of a couple of hours, that, that door's being shut on you and it's back to you know, back to the old school ways and, and off you go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the most frustrating parts that I took from it. That being said, it it's also something that I learned from that is to, to ensure that you don't become one of those managers yourself um, yeah. in whatever mm -hmm. career you go into. So um, I make sure that I try my hardest to ensure that I don't become um, any part of the frustrate frustrations that I had with, with peers in the past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So great background, and obviously you've learned a lot from that retail side. So we're, we're, we're talking supermarkets a lot here and retail. Let, let's get into the, the bio yeah, okay. stuff. How did this happen? I'm, I'm intrigued. I'll, I'll be completely honest. So um, I had a very, very good friend of mine. Um, we had started our career at Sainsbury's together, been best of friends ever since, and he moved up to the northeast, uh, was doing extremely well for himself. What I would class as very entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. um, we stayed in very close contact, um, both my family and his family. 
and then uh, he knew I'd had enough of food retail. There'd been a few life changes that had happened along the way. Um, so yeah, I was looking for an out, but you know, wh where do you go? What do you, what do you do? Especially where I was currently living at the time, and with family commitments as well. Mm -hmm. And then he phoned me up one day and he said, um, "We're b both film fanatics. Absolutely love our films." And he said, "Oh, you know, Back to the Future too." <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, you sure you're ready?" Of course, I, <laughs> I see it on a rerun. Three Back to the Future. Yeah, three. yeah. Well, <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, you know, Back to the Future too. And I was like, "Yeah." He said, "You know where she scanned the mum's or daughter scans her finger to get in the door?" Oh, right, he okay. went, "Yeah, yeah." I go, he goes, "I've got one." I was like, "Never." He said, "Yeah, I've got one." You know, I'm sure we're going to make millions out of this idea, and and off we go. Um, he said, "So I want you to come up and run." this side of the business for me um and it was probably the timing was was the right time for me to make such a such a rash decision i guess um because it meant moving up here um which wasn't wasn't a problem i'd been up visiting loads of times and love love the northeast but um the sun was only one at the time so we just had a, a new an, another child um so it meant commuting pretty much every weekend from Bristol airport up to Newcastle and being here in the week um so came up and then um, yeah un unfortunately realized in a, a very short period of time that the product we had or, or as great as it was certainly wasn't gonna make us millions um so what, were you were you buying these in and then reselling it, them on it or? was it was a fingerprint door lock um, all, all built into one that he had sourced from uh, China mm -hmm. at the time. It was a good, good quality product. Good you were, quality you were installing them? Um, no. Is that what you guys are no, doing? No, no, no. They just came out them? boxed out. Yeah. D distribute's a big word. I think it was, <laughs> it was more of a, yeah, to, if, you know, if, if you, um, if you imagine that, you know, all, all I was used to was intranet systems. Okay. Uh, so any, uh, computerized system was all through retail it was all closed down uh, you didn't use microsoft you didn't use anything at all you just used sainsbury's or cws's systems which were all pretty much the same and yeah then i had to come up and realized that i didn't even know how to send an email on okay. on outlook i didn't mm -hmm. know how to I'd, it'd probably been 20 years since i used word days fact, before ebay huh no ebay Days before then, was it? Um, no, there was eBay because oh, okay. yeah, that's how I bought my first mobile phone. So yeah, there was definitely <laughs> eBay. Yeah, and, and sold my first mobile phone for ten thousand pounds, <laughs> which I was over the moon about, and then realised I got a hundred and twenty quid charge, and the ten thousand pound didn't arrive. But that, that's a whole new other story. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, um, but but I guess um, I I got the biometric bug. That, that's what okay. had happened. I was yeah. absolutely fascinated <clears throat> by the technology. I, I couldn't believe, I mean, this unit, you could hold 100 unique fingerprints. Um, and I, I just couldn't get my head around how 100 people could register their finger and go up to this fingerprint door lock and, and get in. The simplicity of it um, w was fantastic. But the product itself, you know, had a few issues okay. in, it, in its own design. Um so leading on from that, I, because I'd made such a commitment um, to come up, um, I wanted to prove to myself more than anything. I had to learn everything from scratch, um, you know, even down, like I said, to computer systems. We didn't have, we didn't have money, we didn't have budgets for marketing. Just it was, just the two of you? It was just me. All right. Okay. Uh, he was off, you know. He obviously was involved. Okay. Um, as the owner of the business, mm -hmm. um, but no, when it came to the day-to-day -day running it was pretty much myself right i did turn up we did have a product we did have a <clears> supplier we did have a website um as limited as that was in, in its time I and mean, when it was one product um <clears throat> so yeah I, I got the biometric bug um and realized that there was value in biometrics in whatever format you were looking for um it offered a lot of outcomes and benefits compared to comparative to existing access controlled systems on the market so anything that's card pin proc swipe all of these systems that are out there which people are paying a lot of money for are not really mm -hmm. secure i can give you my card and you can get in as me i can share the <laughs> pin number so you're paying all this money for this system but it, it's not really a security system whereas the biometrics i can't just give you my finger and 
off off you go. Um, you know, it, it's pretty secure. You've got to be there to open that door. So there's complete traceability of, of that particular system. Yeah. So I started researching biometrics globally and became fascinated with um, a, a lot of the product offerings that were out there. And more importantly, the claims that were being made to these product offerings. And I eventually taught the owner around to um, enabling me to visit certain suppliers, which were predominantly in the Far East. So I went to Hong Kong, went to China, and went to South Korea. There was one company in America. I'm uh, glad I didn't go to them because they, they sold out. And then there's the biggest um, manufacturer really is in, in France. But most suppliers at the time were the Far East. So I talked to Matt into spending some of his hard-earned cash and send me over to the Far East to investigate all of these companies and mm -hmm. their product portfolios, which was extremely interesting. Um, first time I'd ever suffered jet lag, which was not interesting. Um, yeah, Somebody thought it was a good <laughs> idea that um, because it was such a long flight <clears throat> that I didn't sleep the night before because I would sleep on the plane, which I didn't sleep on the plane. And then arrived in South Korea thinking it was going to be warm. I don't know why. I just, you know, my head said long distance travel, you're going somewhere that's going to be hot. So packed for the summer. And then I remember uh, um, Jaku, his name was, who met me at the airport. And I'm coming through my trolley and he, he said, oh, where's your coat? And I'm looking at him like, how are you, man? I live in the Northeast. You haven't got a clue. It's, it's going to be like a sauna over here. And then the airport doors opened, and wow, I've never felt cold like that in my life. So I've been up like 48 hours. Um, and then they, <laughs> everywhere I went, people were pointing because I wasn't, I wasn't at the tourist areas. I was at the business end. So I don't think they'd ever seen anybody over five and a half foot. Um, and it becomes, yeah, so you got 48 hours, no sleep. You're freezing cold. Um, you've spent all this money to get over there and, and then your head's going like, okay, this is a bit weird and why are people pointing and staring? And then I went, then we went to get something to eat and yeah, there's, there was no, you know, like English translation on stuff and I, I got a severe nut allergy. So then panic kicked in and yeah, then, then the jet lag hit, but anyway, sorry. I, 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 <laughs> it's just one of those funny stories you come. Yeah. I got loads actually. Um, yeah, it's a, but you're more interested in the business, obviously. So, um, yeah, I, I eventually sourced um, a number of companies and managed to talk one company in particular who I really did like their product range into an exclusivity deal, which was you know, something I'd never done before. And Exclusive as in European distribution? Become, yeah, yeah, to become the sole distributor yeah. of their complete portfolio. Yeah. Um, and I think the contract at the time was worth like a, a million pounds, um, which obviously I talked them down. <laughs> considerably um to to get this deal over the table and um demonstrate to them how we were going to go out and promote the product and i think the fact that we already had some substance behind us as mm -hmm. a biometric supplier i mean they didn't know the numbers of what we yeah, were yeah, or were yeah. not doing at the time but yeah secured this deal which was fantastic and then all of this kit arrived um which i thought was great and it looked really futuristic and brilliant and then it was a sudden realization of um okay now i've got to sell it mm -hmm. well, so you hadn't sold it before you got it you waited till you actually got it physically yeah pretty much yeah okay. yeah in hindsight that's maybe not such a um <laughs> yeah so yeah i mean I, I i told them you know um giving them correct data on how many security installers there were in the uk and okay. we were very much focused on the uk at the time but there were also conversations are then taken over europe and um which yeah i'm sure they were getting very excited about but okay. i was still processing how 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 am i going to do this in the uk let alone anywhere else was this a bit figure before you make it style or were you all right with this no it was, it was all <laughs> it was the, as i said it was factual data that i gave them <laughs> As in regards to how many installers there were, it's, you know, whether or not they misinterpreted our, <laughs> our direct link with those installers at the time was, was extremely interesting. Um, yeah, so... Do you I, still work with these guys now, or...? Oh, no. Oh, no, okay, no, that's no, fine. No, <laughs> no, no. This was another company I worked for. This is how I got into doing oh, what okay. I'm doing now. Um, 
so I mean, very long story short, then I ended up um, having to go out and sell the technology. I probably did sold the first um, biometric construction site in the UK, which was actually in Middlesbrough at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, that was for the what was the new police station. So you're talking now, what, 12, 12 years ago? So this is more. before you go on site, you scan your finger, you've yeah, got the put authorization. Yeah, it a turnstile. Um, okay. And the turnstile we um, received from uh, another company. And I'll never forget it. I was suited and booted. It was snowing outside. I turned up with all our kit. The turnstile arrived. The guy with the turnstile, the engineer, and um, was there. And I said, "Right, mate." I said, "Here's all the all the stuff you need to put on it." And he went, oh, "I'm not touching that." And I'm like, "What do you mean you're not touching that?" I said, you, "Part of the deal is you got, no." He said, "I'm here to install what you've bought off of us. I'm not here to install your kit." Well, that was <laughs> yeah. What should have probably taken three to four hours to install four days later we were still there um luckily a a lad that was working with me as well at the time trying to install all of this kit dealing with mains that were twelve thousand volts or something and not having really a clue what we were doing and then (laughs) i think the most you know important part to that was understanding how a South Korean company translates their <laughs> men, their manuals and then finding out on day four um, when you've literally got nothing left in your soul to give that they've done all the wiring diagrams the wrong way round and yeah and some of the wording was not translated <clears throat> correctly and mm-hmm. yeah so huge huge lessons learned mm-hmm. um, but again you know not only lessons learned that I don't regret because manuals then became extremely important moving forward Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and understanding them, especially if we were going to look to resell the kit. Um, And then I sold the first nursery system in the UK, which we ended up winning an award for as well. Not just that one, but the amount of systems we put out. But it wasn't wasn't so much about going out and selling the biometrics itself. Um, That was a, a secondary product. What it was going out and selling the unique outcomes and benefits that biometrics offers to the end user yeah and we dealt then and sold directly to end user and that that company grew um but it, the the other huge problem that we had at the time um was as soon as you come up or you go into a meeting with somebody and you you're promoting biometrics and and what it does and it, it was still relatively new as well within the industry people then start reinventing it for you and telling you what else you can go and do with it <laughs> and um as i said the, the business had grown and the, there were more owners at that time and um they ended up going in different directions on different routes to market for biometrics and um yeah it got to the point then when i had two options really either i was going to leave um that company and, and go back home after you know, a good few years of uh, hard work uh, for, for very little reward. Um, or I had the idea of doing my own product. And the reason for looking to do my own product is one of the biggest shortfalls in biometrics from everything, and, and still today as well, is the claims that these companies were making on their product capabilities and um, didn't actually stand up in what we class as real-world <coughs> deployment. So if you're going to go up to a card reader and use a card and it doesn't work, then there's something wrong with the reader or the card. And all that reader's got to do is read the same card with just a different ID on. But when it comes to a biometric product, there's two things that can happen. If it doesn't work, the user can then think there's something wrong with themselves or it doesn't like me, (laughs) which isn't the case. It doesn't choose who it decides to let in or doesn't let in. But the reliability of current technologies, um, even still into the market now, you're probably looking at a 5 to 10% of population that aren't able to use it. And then you've got the added issue as well where the design of these products, for UK, Europe, US, you're looking at a lot of the biometric technologies, um, no matter which one they are, the first line of defense for any business is on the external. So then you're looking at environmental conditions as well and then you've got to also understand that this product i mean we can we can actually store per reader now fifty thousand unique users so if you go up and you're one of fifty thousand people and scan your fingerprint 
it's got to find you uh, as unique within mm. those 50,000 pre-registered templates on the system and do everything else and open the door and flash the lights in just over a second. And that's what we're able to do now. It was, it was 100 users 12 years ago. I mean, we could, we could easily go up to a million <clears throat> users now, no no problem yeah. at all, not, yeah. that, not that there's much ask for that. That'd be a long queue at a door, right, if you've got a million people <laughs> trying to get in. Um, but there are reasons for that when you look at larger systems. Um, so I made the decision to make my own product. After all the experience I had with selling the products, after all the experience I had with installing them, learning the shortfalls of products, dealing with other manufacturers, um, I began to realize really quickly that I could actually build a product that, that and it was very much UK centric at the time, weren't looking to go anywhere else at that particular time, but I could build a product that would meet the needs and demands of the you know customers mm -hmm. um so that's yeah that's how i got into that i can't even believe i'm going to ask this question but i'm, but I'm gonna what does it what does it actually do i get it so the way i'm thinking now is i was in the airport last week you know, a couple weeks ago in, in india and they had the, the they were taking people's thumbprints uh -huh. but the lady in front of me must have been there about five minutes she was getting really nervous because it would not take off it was beeping all the time going red and flashing red and I was sitting there thinking, like, what is it actually doing? Is it just your fingerprint? Is it going deeper down? Is it the pressure? Is so Mo most fingerprint readers uh, use what's called an optical um, scanner. And the best way to really, or any of them, thermal capacitance or even optical scanners, the best way to describe it is the sonar on a submarine. Okay. So sonar will ping down to the seabed, and then it keeps receiving the signal back at different times, mm -hmm. and then it's able to map out the seabed now fingerprint reader whether that be light optical or whatever version is using is it's the same sort of principle it's sending a beam of light up to the fingerprint and then it's receiving it back on a photo cell at different times because you've got ridges mm -hmm. and when it's receiving these images back at different times that's able to then map out um, an image of your fingerprint and then what happens then is an algorithm will actually look at unique points so you can have uh, bifurcations dots ridge end ridge endings or you get pattern based algorithms as well so they're looking for just the pattern itself and they'll then process that with stored data that they've already got so they're looking for these unique reference mm. points that's how most systems work but the problems you have there is straight away people with skin conditions okay um, especially in external environments, sunlight can affect the light itself on the scanning capabilities. Um, <clears throat> you've also got if it's wet, so or creams or oils or dirt or dust or debris will fill the ridges. Mm -hmm. So then the actual scanner isn't able to identify the fingerprint. So it, in that instance, there, I, I, I would assume that um, that person themselves is having you know, one of those five to 10% problems. But w were they scanning the passport first? So the biometric data was on the passport. Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. so that's what's classed as a one-to-one -one match. Oh, so right, okay. realistically, that should be a lot easier. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But if the scanning technology isn't up to it, then it doesn't matter how many times you scan, it's yeah. not going to match you with your stored data. That's why I asked, because when I look at the technology, it was, I mean, I could have done better myself. <laughs> yeah, bit. yeah. Okay, yeah. So I, I would just like to state as well, ours is way better <laughs> well, that, than, than that. <laughs> Before anybody sat here thinking, okay, so he's just completely and utterly slated uh, everything there about. We'll no. edit that bit out, it's fine. No, no, <laughs> our, our success is based on delivering where, yeah. where other manufacturers that's where, I, that's where I was leading to, because you said you wanted to create a product that you felt that did this and that and you know you had your own specification functionality you wanted to build in yeah that was my question to you do you see these falls in some of these other readers and said actually we want to make this world lead and we want to make it so good it, it you know has a very minimal failure rate yeah is that something that you, absolutely yeah that's yeah. exactly what we did um, and yeah. when i when i did well the, dug out of that yeah 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 uh, yeah you are i came up with um 21 design points that i wanted to achieve okay. which was which was quite a lot um, so the first product, which was called the iEvo Reader, um, iEvo stands for Intelligent Evolution, which yeah. I made up. I was always told that if you're going to come up with a company name, that you should use three or four letters, and it should be difficult for 
people to pronounce because then they'll remember it more. Right. So, yeah, that's an I iPod at the time was, mm -hmm. you know, I this, I that. So I was like, okay, I Evo. Checked it. Nobody had had it. So yeah, it's registered now, which is which is fantastic. Sounds a bit better than that woman off Back to the Future Two, who was M McFly. Yeah, you know, yeah, couldn't you, call you, it the McFly Reader. Yeah, yeah. It was, might have <laughs> might have offered a few challenges. <laughs> yeah, in, I think yeah, so. In in understanding it, um, where was I? I Evo sounds better. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So twenty one point <clears throat> design list. Mm -hmm. um, so technology wise, I was able to um, deliver that. Um, for example, our our actual reader will scan four millimeters below the skin. So we do, we can scan your uh, dermis and epidermis. So what's classed as your real fingerprint. The only reason you have a fingerprint itself is underneath your skin, you have collagen ridges, capillaries, and other bits and bobs that push your skin up. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't actually have a fingerprint. So your true fingerprint is actually underneath your skin mm -hmm. as well. And our ultimate reader can scan four millimeters below the skin. It actually takes nine images all at once. Uh, using different polarizations of light and different wavelengths of light. And these different wavelengths of light as well are able to combat uh, certain conditions. So our reader can actually scan your fingerprint submerged underwater. Not that you need it submerged underwater unless you're going to install one on a submarine, I guess. But, you know, the, there's advantages there. Mm -hmm. um, grease, oil, dirt, levels of dust, debris, it can do all of that. And there's many other features as well within the reader. Um, the reader head itself has got a built-in thermostat controlled heating system and environmental controls. So for cold weather, especially that we've experienced here, most most other manufacturers of readers will fail at zero degrees. Ours have worked down to minus 20 degrees. And we've had some uh, change to work even below that in, mm -hmm. in some parts of the world. Um, it's IP rated 65, so dust, water, ingress is all taken care of. And there's lots of other uh, security features built in to the reader head as well that um you know take us a step further than any of our competitors products so was this user led r d so did your customers say you know i would like a reader but we need it to go down to 20 degrees below we need it to do x y and um, z i didn't go out and do research with <clears> users <throat> because i built that research up over years okay. um and I, I knew what the shortfalls were yeah. going out and selling the mm -hmm. technology or trying to promote the technology or you know de dealing with end users who had frustrations with the products that were out in the market mm -hmm. and, and still do you know today with with other manufacturers products um <clears throat> which which is a shame really if there's one country in particular um which we're we're doing extremely well in now um but when we went out there at the time we actually had come across one tender where it was written in the tender that a 30 percent failure rate was acceptable because they had become so used to mm -hmm. the technology 30% of the time not working, it was more like 40 probably, that that just became the norm. And it, it was quite a challenge at the beginning to go out into that market and say to them, well, actually we can we can do this a bit mm -hmm. better. In mm -hmm. fact, not only can we do it better, we have what's classed as a 0% failure to acquire mm -hmm. a fingerprint um, because we can get your you know, dermis and epidermis. Mm -hmm. So we'll always acquire a fingerprint. That yeah. being said, there needs to be enough data there then for the algorithm to also identify you. So what, what is the use use case for this then? Is it construction sites you've mentioned? Is, is these people trying to get on site and you've got to, if they've got the right level of authorization, you let them on or? Well, we, we don't, we just manufacture and- um, You don't we, really- No, we don't deal with end user. Right, okay. that, that's one thing I did learn from, right. um, from mm -hmm. the previous company that I worked for. Yeah. And from the very, <clears throat> from the very <clears throat> start of the business, it was all about um, knowing that the adoption of biometrics was there, knowing that the end user interest was there, and more importantly, knowing mm -hmm. that the security industry understood that this is where it's going. Um, and then, you know, we knew we had this installer base of X amount of thousands of installers in the UK, um, and they're going to come across requirements for biometrics. So there's two things we did at, at the very beginning. Um, what One of the key areas that I looked at was all of my competitors' products were trying to compete with what we class as an access control system. So mm -hmm. they were looking to um, sell their product as a complete system. So that'd be software, card reader, mix, biometrics, and you know, all singing, all dancing. Um, so for me as a, a new business, I was like, well, how am I going to go out and compete with 20, 30-year-old, well-established access mm -hmm. control companies in the UK 
if I'm going to go out and sell a product, not the biometric side, because they haven't got that, but how am I going to go and compete with access control when it's something that I don't know 100% about? So I took the decision very early on to become what was classed as a third-party reader. I wanted to be the Intel inside of a laptop, whereas the biometric specialist, I wanted IEVO to be the biometric specialist for um, access control companies in the UK. And I picked on one of the biggest um, access control companies in the UK, manufacturer, based in Brighton. And um, we went down to visit them with our completed product. <clears throat> Excuse me. Went down and presented not only our product, we knew that um, they didn't have their own biometric, uh, along with most access control manufacturers in the UK didn't have their own biometric, but we're, we're all looking to add one of our competitors' mm -hmm. products because they felt they had to have it there if it was going to be requested, but didn't really understand a great deal about it. What they did know is the shortfalls of these technologies because when you're attaching somebody else's product to your own, then you've got to stand by it somewhat. Yeah. And they were not promoting these products as such, but saying, yes, this can work with our system and then getting the problems. And of course, then they're not going to go to the Far East manufacturer for the issues. They're then going to look at this manufacturing company in the UK. So it was causing them issues. So we went down and demonstrated the product capabilities um, firsthand, which completely and utterly blew them away. And then the the creme de la creme, I guess, is we had already integrated our product without them knowing into their software, um, which they didn't have a clue about. So when we actually demonstrated our products and registered them, we registered the directors through their own software yeah. onto our system, and it was all seamless. In behind, there was, you know, people sweating and <laughs> whatever else. But yeah, we and <clears throat> that, I think, was um, a good move forward for us at the time. So... Mm -hmm. We're pretty much integrated now into every access control system manufacturer in the UK and also increasingly worldwide as well with some of the, the even bigger companies, which is great. Um, more importantly, we're the only um, biometric offering for most of these companies, which is brilliant. We're the only company to be seamlessly embedded into their software platform as their only choice. They don't necessarily promote some do, some don't. We have different mo we have different business models for different access control manufacturers. But on top of that as well, we have an ever-growing list of what we call specialized integrators who will offer a system for um, a specific market. So like going back to what you said to construction, we have companies who do construction software, and they understand that at the forefront of that technology that they offer, they need to ensure that the data they're providing, because it's all about data control or user control, uh, health and safety, CSCS cards on construction, that the security device that they have at the front is going to ensure that that person is who they say they are, yeah. point number one. And then more importantly, that in that harsh environment, an external environment, construction environment, that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do as a business. So I think industry-wise that we, we actually track and monitor, we're probably talking about 20 industries now. Across that discussion there, you mentioned we a few times. So, can I just drill into the business? Or how does that look like? How does it set up? Oh, we we is uh, we as in IE or so me and my team. <laughs> okay, have a absolutely fantastic yeah. team of people, um, which is you know growing year on year, um, as is the business is growing year mm -hmm. on year. Um, we have uh, you know senior engineer, principal engineer. We have hardware engineer. We have um, our own in-house software. Um, we do all our own um, assembly, part build, and manufacture. We don't do raw PCB board. Um, we have marketing, we have export, we have a full UK sales team. So, yeah, it's uh, it's come on quite a lot actually. Mm -hmm. and, and what were some of the challenges across that? So you've you've grew, you've added to the team, you've become a manufacturer, you, you're exporting now. I, I wrote something down and, and which you mentioned was lessons learned. So you you have learned a few lessons along the way. Is there any other hurdles that you could tell us about that you've been on that journey? Yeah, how long have you got? <laughs> I know. Uh, Why well, did I even ask that? Well, yeah. <laughs> I think anybody who runs a business yeah. could sit here for hours and tell you about hurdles. Mm -hmm. um, I, I th I, I'm thinking... Pretty, uh, one of the biggest things I have learned is pretty much every two years, an unexpected, you know, unbelievably high mm -hmm. hurdle mm -hmm. comes along 
and um, hits you where it hurts. And as frustrating as they are, you you can't you you know something's coming, but you don't know what it is. That's the most frustrating bit. Yeah. And normally it's something that's out of your control. Um, but the lessons you learn from that and how bigger, you know, and more prepared you you become as a business, as a team, as a whole, as a business owner, um, I, I think they're invaluable really to to come across. You've also then got the few curveballs as well with um, you know Brexit, for example. I'm not going to turn this into a political debate, but um, you know you go to bed at two a, two o'clock in the morning watching mm-hmm. watching the Brexit vote, thinking everything's you know staying in. And then you wake up at 7 a.m. and you realize you've just lost 20 grand a month due to dollar rate. And at that point, you're like, okay, right. So <laughs> that, that was a bit of a curveball I wasn't expecting. But um, supply, supplier issues can also be, can also be a problem. Um, we try and, you know, get as, we try and utilize the services of, of the Northeast as much as we can. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm not just saying that. Um, a lot of the companies we utilize down to external design companies, PCB manufacturer, um, our tool makers um, for all of our product castings and stuff, we are all local. Um, we like to keep everything as local as we can because it gives us greater control yeah. over that. Um, so I think that's helped us avoid a few hurdles. I'm sure there are um, some, um, or there used to be some money saving um, views with regards to relying on exportation, uh, importation. Sorry, but then you've also got the challenges of you know something disappearing and you you not knowing about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the, you know, over the years, there's been a couple of times where I've, I've shut the doors at night and thought, uh oh, um, that that's not gone too well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you dust yourself down, pick yourself back up, and come back after the weekend and get it sorted. Yeah. Thinking about growing that team, then it's a it's a technical product. You've you've mentioned you have a principal engineers and senior engineers that kind of thing. Is there an opportunity to bring young people through? I mean, the first thing I wrote down was actually you said you had a limited CV back in the day. If you remember that, them ironmonger days. Yeah. Is this something the business can look at maybe to bring apprentices in? Is that something? Yeah, that... we've we've done apprentices. Okay. Um, we've done post grads. We've mm-hmm. had people in mid graduation as well. And bi- biometrics isn't on a lot of people's CVs, yeah, yeah, yeah. especially in the UK. <laughs> so when I hear you know people talking about skills shortages for mm-hmm. the Northeast, I'm like, wow. Talk about skills shortages for just the <laughs> biometric industry as a whole. Okay. Um, so. You know, but that, that's stuff that we can teach people coming in. Mm-hmm. And, and believe me that some of the guys that have come in, and when I say guys, I mean male and female, um, some of the people that come into the business have brought some serious value to the business as well. Apprenticeships, um, uh, you know, everybody who comes into IEVO is told the same thing from day one. We're a growing business, and I look to build a team that's going to grow with the business. So everybody has career path opportunities within IEVO. And we've proven that, you know, we've had people who've come in um, as a sales role who are now managing a team of people. We've had people who've progressed through the business. We've looked at apprentices. We don't just bring an apprentice in. We bring an apprentice in to um, add value to their knowledge base and Mm -hmm. train and put, you know, the time and effort into them to look then for them to become an employee and a value value member of IEVO. And then that's when we get back our investment. So yeah, we're, we're very strong on that. Um, we've also got some people within the business who have, you know, um, come from not competitors, but different industries that add value to the business who are experienced in, mm-hmm. in what they do as well. So what about you, Sean? So you've you mentioned the team there, growing the team, um, you know, bringing, bringing the team on. What about you as a person? Do you have a mentor? I mean, who, who, who kicks you? Who, who do you go to? Because it's quite tough sometimes and quite a, a lonely place for yeah. an entrepreneur and an MD. Do, do you have s- such a person that you can help you with? I don't, I don't actually class myself as entrepreneur. I think the word entrepreneur is o- overused personally. I think an entrepreneur is somebody who's um, looked at multiple businesses mm-hmm. or um, been successful in one and then gone off to do something else. Um, I have a non-exec um, which I've had now for a good few years. Um, I have a great relationship with that non-exec because it's complete opposite of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's, he's not a yes man. Um, 
in fact quite quite the opposite and probably some of the most heated debates I've had at, at board level have been with non exec but um, <laughs> yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't change that for the world because yeah. um, that that challenges myself um, uh, support of my wife is is fantastic um, but she, no, she's you, watching on live Sorry, if you're watching live, is that why you had to I get hope you? Not. She's, a, she, she's a teacher, so unless <laughs> oh, a whole, right, unless no, a no. whole class is watching this, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yeah, but yeah, that's twenty quid, um, <laughs> yeah. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, no, you're right. It is it is lonely, and you you're challenging, you question yourself, and yeah. you don't sleep. In fact, and this is no word of a lie. Some some of the, in fact, my whole management team are used to this now. Some my I have a problem distinguishing between dream and reality with regards to <laughs> some of the best business meetings I've had <laughs> have been a dream. And then in the management meeting, I've started discussing <laughs> what I believe we had all discussed. And then they're all looking at me as if to say, uh, and they're like, you, I think you dreamt that one. I'm like, right. And, uh, but then, uh, can, can you cut that? No, and then, <laughs> and then um, yeah, but no, it's it's a great idea. So I don't, as a business owner, you you never shut off. Yeah. Uh, but I'd like you know, support from my wife is understanding that even when you're on holiday, um, I set aside a an amount of time, not not a great deal, but you you, you can't just you know work life balance um, when you're running your own business. I, I just I don't think that really exists. I think you just got to cope along the way and you've got to do what you've got to do yeah um when you when you're involved in your business and you're running your own business um you know, it's different if you're a business owner and you have an md and whatever and you turn up once a month but that that's not me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so yeah it's um it, it is lonely I, you're probably the first person who's asked us that but yeah no you're you're right it is mm -hmm, it can mm -hmm. be a lonely existence in in some regards yeah but also very rewarding and in terms of your non-execs, so you've got some good targets going forward for the, for the, or do you have a three-year plan, a year plan? Um, well, we, depending on what we're looking to do as a mm -hmm. business, um, people will say, you know, what's your, what's your five-year plan? Well, mm -hmm. good luck if you can write yeah, one of them yeah, and agree. stick to it. Three-year plan is more of your roadmap, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but then we have our, our annual plan. So business objectives are set every year by myself. Yeah. And then they're filtered down to management team mm -hmm. uh, KPIs, key performance indicators. Yeah. So all this stuff as well that, you know, you learn from retail is all there. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I have an open door policy as well on, on my office. And then all of that uh, information, business objectives, management KPIs is there for every single person within the business to see or view whenever they want, including forecast as well for the year. Um, and then they, we also do a annual um, report, so everybody in the business um, comes in, and and then we do a half year one as well. Um, so they get shared with all the information and um, get an understanding of where we're like looking to take the business mm -hmm. for the next year. So we keep focused on each year by year as you know the business objectives, but when it comes to longer term plans, yeah, I've probably got a good twenty years up in my head. Okay. One last one before we take it to the floor. What's next for your industry? So are we are we talking retina scans here? Or are we going, what does the future look like? Well, fingerprint <laughs> is still over 50% of the global market. Okay. Retina um, is, you know, well, not retina. I, retina's gone. Right. Iris scanning, okay. facial, gait, the way you walk. There's loads of different biometric yeah. technologies, but um, fingerprint's still still the top and <laughs> serving us well. Um we, we always keep an eye out. We always test other technologies. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for different ways. So one of the beauties of IEVO is we can do what we want, when we want, and yeah, yeah. pretty much how we want, um, even down to algorithm-based. Um, so there's a lot going on this year for us. Um, there's a lot where we're uh, increasing in our product portfolio and our product range to um, gain the same good growth that we're experiencing in certain markets just down to product development so it's about design of the product which mm -hmm. I learned from dnm back in the day i've worked with them ever since been absolutely fantastic um yeah good plug that's 20 quid <laughs> um yeah no you know why i'm here today and yeah. if it wasn't for them uh, at the very beginning to to believe in what we wanted to deliver then I, I doubt we'd be where we are today because i didn't have a clue about design 
Um, but what I've learned now about implementation of design itself into meeting your customers' needs and demands is is what we're going to be about as a business mm -hmm. for the for the next twelve months. Excellent. So yeah, what, watch the website if you want and see what's coming out imminently. Brilliant. It's been really insightful, Sean. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. What I want to do is take it to the floor, see if we've got any questions. What I will remember to do is repeat your question. So keep, keep it quite succinct, please. Or you can shout out. We we'll still might get it picked up. So has anybody got any questions for Sean? Yes, Carl. Hi, Sean. There's, there's obviously a lot of benefits of technology, but do you think there's a reason why it hasn't really caught on in the domestic market? A domestic market is actually one of one of my aspirations in probably my 20 year longer term and um, price is number one so although we although we can deliver technology wise now there's there's quite a few issues to consider i mean the original product as i said for the other company i worked for was a biometric door lock for your home um i'll tell you a very quick story as well i was a, a guest speaker at the biometric global conference um and I was getting rather frustrated within the industry because they were talking about the, the biometric boom and you know this big bubble and when it was going to happen and the same story every single year. And I went out and told them the, the real problems with biometrics and why it wasn't growing as much as it should be. And the three American guys came over after my presentation um, and asked for an hour of my time and asked me exactly the same question that you've just asked which was with regards to domestic adoption of biometric technologies for, for your home. So I started then telling them all of the issues with biometric technologies and the adoption of this in the domestic market, to which as I'm continually, you know, just letting everything out, their faces are dropping and dropping and dropping. And it turned out um, by the end of the hour, when I think two of them were pretty much crying, that they had just had multi-million dollar investment into uh, launching a biometric door lock for the American market that had gone out to, what's their um, big Home Home Depot or something, oh, something yeah, like so, that. Yeah. Um, all of their stands had gone out to Home Depot, <laughs> lavished with all of these door locks, and then they realized within the hour that had completely and utterly destroyed their product. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. 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 and yeah i think they lasted about six months unfortunately so um te technology is there well we've got technology that'll deliver plug um price point is not there and then you've got the complexity of the actual door itself and that's where the problem lies there are so many different uh point locking systems there are so many different types of doors that as soon as you look putting a biometric onto it then it needs to become electronic and then your price goes through the roof as well and how do you install it the reader is easy to install but then you've got to look at the locking mechanism itself on the door companies out there are now still selling stuff and trying and they're really easy to get into in fact extremely easy and one one of the best adverts i ever saw for this fingerprint door lock which they had done um is that they were demonstrating the fact that the fingerprint door lock was waterproof but then I looked at the sensor and I'm like, well, it, it won't scan your finger if the door lock's wet. It, it won't work. And what they had done is they had sprayed the door lock and just as the finger was coming up about a centimetre away, they'd obviously cut, dried it, and then carried on with the, <laughs> with the image. So, yeah, they were, they were falsely demonstrating the, the product capabilities. But um, what, watch this space. Got, got some good ideas moving forward, but price point will be key. Thanks, Carl. Yes, Natalie? Do you find yourself looking at people's hands and do people like show you their hands and go, oh, would you be able to make this work? Because I've been sitting here looking at my fingers <laughs> and I can't <laughs> this one would work on Sean's system. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I have. So, Sean, I'll just repeat that one. Do you find yourself looking at people's hands? No. <laughs> No, is is the no? I don't go around looking at people's hands. It's bad enough that I dream some meetings, let alone let alone have a hand fetish to to add on top of that. Um, but no, that you know, um, within the industry itself, within the security industry, there there was one instance which I'll never ever forget. Um, I went down to demonstrate big uh, industry security industry um, installer on on a national level. Went down and met with the MD demonstrating our product and you know all of its claims 
And then he turned around and said, okay, so that'll be able to scan through. And I was like, yeah. He said, okay. And then he picked up his phone and called this gentleman in. Well, I've never seen fingers like it in my life. <laughs> um, and he said, okay, if you can get him to scan, because he can't scan on anything else at all, um, then, you know, we'll we'll do some business. And he was a, a guitar player um, who didn't use a whatever it's called. Um, so huge calluses on, on the fingers <laughs> and um, registered to him. It registered, which, I mean, inwardly, I was absolutely sweating because I'd never seen anything <laughs> like it. And then, um, yeah, and then he went, okay, so he's now on your system, so he'll work. And I said, yeah, he'll, he'll definitely work. So he put his finger on, bang, green, got that in straight away. Well, this guy just stormed off. The MD started laughing. He said he was actually sandpapering his fingers <laughs> this morning because he's not been able to get to work on anything else. So, yeah, um, yeah that, you know, that that's a, sub, a real, you know, what a big, long, like somebody desperately trying to beat the product. But we've had loads of instances of that where um, we, we actually, um, you know, we do a lot of business where um, our products are being put in to replace competitors' products that aren't doing what they say they're going to do which is fantastic for us. Um, it's a shame they didn't go with us in the first instance, but it, it just proves biometric adoption and acceptance as a whole is is definitely the way forward. Yeah. Yes, question. Um, what do you do to look for new product ideas and develop new strategies for that? So what do you do to look for new product ideas? What's your strategy? Um, well, some of the... Some of the stuff that we've been working on over the last uh, 18 months is all um, been based on, again, customer feedback. So end user feedback, integrator, installer, but then looking at all of the data as well. So the first reader that we ever built was called the Aiva Reader. Um, in hindsight, we probably should have come up with a different name because that was the company name as well. But we, we pretty much switched that reader to what's now called the Ultimate Reader. And that's the one that delivers in, you know, the harshest of environments and our flagship product, really. We then have another reader called the Micro. Um, and it in the markets that it does extremely well in, it, it does really well in. But it's almost over-specified for some other markets. Um, it, it's too much. It does it does too much. They don't, don't require that. Um, and then there are other installation... Um, you know, we look at everything as a whole when it comes to design of a product, not just the end user part, not just the ergonomics, not just the aesthetics, but also from an installer's point of view or an integrator's point of view. We've got to look at every single part of it. And then, you know, um, there's a particular UK government accreditation, which unfor unfortunately we're not allowed to promote, but we are um, certified by them. All very top secret. Um, so there are other security features as well that we've got to look at within the design of the product. Excellent. Yes, go, oh, got two questions. Okay, we'll go here first. Have you installed readers yeah. in any unlikely places? Yeah, well, not personally, <laughs> but yeah. Um, you know, I was I was actually preempting that question because that's knowing where this podcast is going on a global scale. Normally, when I'm I'm telling. Or telling so it's, there are loads of places we've had our readers installed that we're not allowed to talk about, which is really really frustrating because mm. some of them are like if it would be a PR dream. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not going to say anything. Bite your tongue, bite your tongue. Um, yeah, um, I, t I tell you one of the best best t two 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 or three times really that actually blown my mind was. Um, I remember in a taxi in London with my UK account manager, I'm on the phone, we're trying to get back to King's Cross. All of a sudden he's having an absolute head fit and whacking the window to the point I'm just like, what is wrong with He's finally lost it. I mean, this is my UK sales manager and he's lost the plot. And he's going like that and he's pointing. And then, yeah, sure enough, there are our readers and they've been installed outside this this building. And that was really weird to see your own product, something that you've designed and there in in situ you don't normally get to see it being a manufacturer mm. and then when i was with uh, one of my uh, uk account managers we were in canary wharf um and he said right just so you know he said you got readers on that building that building that building that building that building and that completely and utterly mm. blew my mind as well um and then the best one i think for for myself was coming out of durham train station with my son 
we were sat in front of the car <clears> and then there was a site opposite and all of a sudden my son went dad there's your readers and that <laughs> completely and utterly blew his mind as well yeah. and i didn't know they were there obviously we don't know a lot of the time where our product ends up um but we, we've got some fantastic installations some really really high profile um installations which, which are great and uh, we you know we've been shipping pallets of stuff overseas for larger installs as well which is fantastic um but yeah sometimes it's the it's the smaller ones that for my son it was just it was How a, a real like 14 14 it was a realization of wow yeah yeah yeah, that, <laughs> yeah just a proud moment so yeah. he's gonna do his apprenticeship uh, no. <laughs> no. No. Did his work experience. But, uh, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, no Excellent. apprenticeship, no. What a question over here? Uh, yeah, so just in the back, how long will they have it? Where's the data stored? So where's the data stored? Uh, uh, so the first most important part with regards to our EVOs, we're not, not the same as APHIS, we're not the same as the police. We don't store your actual fingerprint. Uh, we don't contravene any data protection or human right laws. And anything that is stored um, is held on the end user's secure system. We don't have access to it, so it falls under their own data protection rules. Any other questions for Sean? No, I'd just like to say, Sean, that's been really insightful. Thanks for your open honesty, really good. Um, thanks for the guys, so thanks to Lee, um, Gavin, Graham, great stuff, and, and thanks to the DNN team as well, and thanks to Sean Oakes. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Can I move? You can move.